Hi, I'm Jack. Hi, I'm Rob. Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome to the podcast, Crohn's and Ulcerative Colitis, How to Spell Them and Other Problems. Good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you happen to be. Uh, welcome to this week's episode, um, talking about inflammatory bowel disease, stomas, and all things exercise. Uh, we've got a lovely, fantastic guest with us today who I had the um, pleasure of listening to speak at uh, a recent IA <laughs> support group. Um, Dr. Catherine Jones, um, and she's a lecturer over at Warwick University, um, who is here today. So I'm going to leave the door open for you, Catherine, to introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Tim, for the lovely introduction. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name's Catherine. Um, I am a research fellow based at uh, Warwick Medical School. Um, my main interest and kind of background is in clinical exercise physiology. So kind of looking at all the short term and long term adaptations to exercise and how those look like in different chronic, chronic medical conditions. And my particular interest is in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so I've spent the last oh, how many years? About seven years, eight years now doing research in exercise and IBD. Um, finished, did a PhD in exercise and IBD, which I finished in 2020, which was a long time ago now. Um, and hopefully you find this kind of interesting to listen to. Um, I think if we kind of just discuss kind of just a kind of broad thing of, about exercise and IBD, and I think it's kind of really important to address why exercise might be beneficial, and that's specifically for individuals with IBD. Um, we all know that kind of being physically active um, is important for our health, and we know that helps reduce the risk of disease and boosts our mood and improves kind of our ability to do every day to day activities. Um, but for those with IBD, we'll know kind of the symptoms that are associated with the condition. So things like diarrhea, abdominal pain, fatigue. Um, however, what people may not be quite as familiar about is approximately about 25 to 60 percent of, of adults with IBD will experience another health condition that's outside of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and they're primarily musculoskeletal disorders. So things such as osteoporosis, osteopenia, arthritis, sarcopenia. Um, so things like porous bones, inflammation of the joints, uh, muscle degeneration, which causes loss of muscle strength and function, which are important for our daily daily, uh, daily activities. Um, and the kind of the exact reason why these occur or are more prevalent in IBD is not fully understood, um, but it's thought to thought to occur from a multitude of reasons. So these could include things like the active inflammation. So that increases certain cells and decreases certain cells that are involved in the bone metabolism process. Uh, things like medication side effects, um, malabsorption, and that could be for the fact that people have had surgery, whether that's a stoma, a resection, a J pouch, um, or the fact that they are actively avoiding certain foods because it might upset their stomach. Um, which could result in things like vitamin D deficiencies, poor, cal poor calcium intake, um, and these collectively interfere with the bone metabolism process. Um, so removing old bone tissue and replacing it with new bone tissue um, and the amount of muscle protein available, which is a very, very key ingredient for maintaining our muscle. Um, so these imbalances cause bone loss and muscle wasting. Um, and although exercise is seen as a kind of a first line treatment and it is recognized um, to counteract secondary complications and other conditions. It's quite poorly understood in IBD. Um, and we did a recent systematic review, which was which which was published last year, um, which demonstrated that exercise interventions can have benefits in fatigue, uh, muscular function, um, body composition, um, cardiorespiratory fitness, bone mineral density, um, disease activity, quality of life, and psychological well-being. So a nice list of kind of outcomes that they that the, these interventions did improve. Um, 
the only downside was is that the studies that were included in, in that review um, differed significantly in the kind of the type of exercise it was delivering. So whether it was aerobic resistance, um, the length of duration the program went on, um, the frequency, so how often um, the repetitions were being performed, and also the intensity as well. Um, and a lot of these studies sort of subgrouped um, Crohn's disease and colitis together. Um, so it, it, it it's a, it's a constant challenge for clinicians because they don't know what to discuss with their patients. Um, so there is a kind of a need for, for further larger scale trials to kind of explore sort of exercise prescription um, guidelines for healthcare professionals. I think for me, Catherine, the first thing that jumps out at someone without IBD is if I had joint pain and fatigue and diarrhea, I don't think I'd really want to go and exercise. Yeah. Yeah, and um, that's and that's complete. That's com Do you know what a lot of people, um, especially fatigue? I think fatigue's one of the ones. I think people have this impression that if they're fatigued, exercising is going to make them worse. Um, and fatigue is one of the one of the outcomes that I'm really passionate about. But it's one of the most hardest outcomes to measure, measure because of its complex and its subjectivity. Um, it's hard to diagnose. It's hard to measure. Um, but it's interesting because. Um, the studies that had looked at fatigue actually found that fatigue levels decreased after doing some sort of exercise. And they, they included a range of different types of exercise. So it's not just one specific one was that was more beneficial than the other. Um, but it was quite interesting that fatigue levels did improve um, after, after, a, after doing some sort of exercise intervention. Um, I know when doing my PhD and that looked at whether we can improve bone density after doing a resistance training and impact training program. Um, and that was over six months. And we we did find that bone density did improve in, in some areas and not in others. Um, but one of the things that the clinicians were really, really focused on was the fact that we found fatigue levels improved at six months. Um, so I think it's really interesting that that's, that is a factor. Um, and I think it's, it's just the lack of knowledge that's currently out there with an individuals thinking fatigue levels are going to worsen um with the whole diarrhea aspect i can completely appreciate especially if you've got a more active disease the last thing you're going to want to do is to do any sort of activity um but it, at the moment it, it is it is safe exercise is safe for individuals who have a mild or moderately active disease but in those who have a more severely active disease there's still question marks and stuff around as to whether it's actually safe to do so um so at the, at the moment, if you have a severely active disease, I, you probably don't feel like doing it anyway, uh, but it wouldn't be recommended that you do any sort of uh, physical activity or any sort of exercise intervention, jumping around the house, doing these squat, uh, squat jumps or what have you. I think that really rings true to my personal experience as well. You know, talking about actually doing exercise, what I found was personally, whether the, the evidence reflects this, was I, it made me a different type of tired and then I slept better as a result of it. So yes, I would say I was fatigued, definitely, but I felt a far better with the same level of fatigue if I'd exercised versus if I hadn't. I don't think it made me more you know, kind of chronically fatigued, if you will. And I, the funny story I often mention, I don't know if I mentioned this on the other podcast, but uh, about exercise. I used to do a lot of like, kind of Ironman triathletes, uh, triathlons, that type of stuff, um, even when I was quite unwell. And I said to the consultant once for, for a follow-up, and I said, I'm really quite quite fatigued and quite tired and he said oh what did you do at the weekend and i said oh, I, oh, I did a half iron man and he was like oh that's probably why you're fatigued then isn't it and i was like oh but but i know what's normal for me so that fatigue yeah. is kind of relevant so i'm like well you know i couldn't do a full iron man but i did a half iron man and so that for me showing that level of fatigue if you see what i mean and he just didn't didn't get it and he was like well just don't do that yeah it you'll, wasn't really an option. You, you'll know your own body as well like i think yeah. i think one of the things that we found doing doing like things at like interviews with with uh with patients around around fatigue is that they describe it like obviously universally anyone can 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 be affected by fatigue um but i think one of the things that is kind of different between the description that individuals with ibd or individuals with stomas report is that it's it's just a, it's a different le it's a different type. They can describe it as quite mm. debilitating, quite distressing. Um, that it's kind of a constant state of exhaust exhaustion that isn't kind of relieved by having a nap or having that kind of rest, which is in quite a lot of people. So usually, if someone says, "Yeah, oh, I feel tired," the first response is 
go and have a nap or go and have a rest. Um, whereas that wouldn't necessarily have the same effect after for someone with, with IBD or with a yeah. stoma. And I think it is just a case of you kind of go with what your body is telling you to go with as well. You'll kind of get, I mean, you, you probably, Rob, you'll probably with doing the, the Ironman trials as well, you'll, you'll know what your body's capable of doing and how much you, sh you kind of sh should push yourself and how much you shouldn't push yourself. Um, but it's good to kind of challenge yourself and know what you're capable of doing. And mm. um, I think that's really important. Yeah, and I think the, the way that I describe it to people that don't understand the kind of fatigue that you get, it's like you've you've gone to bed at 4 a.m. on a bender and you've got it for, for work at 6 a.m. It's that kind of complete all-encapsulating, draining feeling. And until you have that, you can't, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm a bit tired. You know, it doesn't really, really, doesn't, doesn't really have the same ring to it. But yeah, it's, it's that completely, you can't, and, you know, sleeping for another few hours is not really going to change that drastically. Yeah. Yeah, and it's. I think it's one of those symptoms as well that, it, as a researcher, um, it's. I think it's one of the most commonly reported symptoms. And I mean, it, it, it's understandable fatigue being there during states of an active disease. I think it's something like eighty percent of if people with an active disease say that they experience some sort of fatigue. But the fact that nearly half of people are still affected by fatigue even when they're in remission, it's they're still quite high numbers, and they're still very. It's a burdening symptom in terms of trying to do daily daily activities um so i think there needs to be a lot a lot of further trials in kind of having fatigue as the main outcome but in terms of how to measure it it's just so difficult and i think that's why there hasn't been those trials that have that have come out yet um it, it's a it's a case of you get your it, you probably you probably had it at uh, Tim and Rob, when you or if you have your bloods taken, you feel tired. You have your bloods taken, and the bloods come back as completely normal, um, and it's quite frustrating. You kind of wish there was something in your bloods, just to, just so you can kind of explain why you're feeling the way that you're feeling. Um, and yeah. I think that's kind of the best way to describe how difficult it is to measure fatigue. Um, obviously, there is scales and questionnaires and stuff out there as well, which is what a lot of these studies studies use. But it is given it's kind of it's complex nature and it's subjective nature and the fact it's very different for everyone makes it extremely difficult to to measure unfortunately yeah i mean i i don't know whether you, it, it's reflected in in your experience catherine but i had so i've had two major flares in, in my time and my, before my first one very similar sort of experience to to what rob was sort of saying there like but completely different sport but i would be doing was whilst I was at university so I'd be doing about 12 hours of gym time 16 hours of sports specific time whilst still doing my physio uh training which was about 22 23 hours a week um and then doing a part-time job and felt tired but when while I'm doing all of those things it's I must be that and, and just like Rob said there like the, the consultant would say well, it's because you're doing all these things so I always put it down to that um coped fairly well and then but this flare this flare oh my goodness like couldn't get out of bed for like i could sleep all day and still not feel any better you don't feel any sort of, and, and, and it's like a duracell battery you, you just mm. you, you recharge but it's not actually recharging it's yeah it's, yeah 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 it's, it's extremely difficult to describe as well yeah really but as, I, as, as i started to become better med medically managed and um, obviously had the surgeries and things like that. It started to um, sort of seesaw round, but still in that position, like, kind of like what uh, Jack was saying at, at the top of the, the episode, like you don't feel like doing anything, but I'd force myself, but then feel better for it. Um, but that before all of the, the medical intervention, like you say, like I could be charged but literally, I'm, I'm still running on empty. Would yeah. would would spend a large chunk of my time just very much um, l lazing around, sleeping, all that. So, so I've kind of had both both, and, and I don't know whether. I mean, from a clinical background, I'm sure Jack sort of would have this as well. Like everybody's different, so I presume that each flare can be different, which again I imagine makes it very difficult for you guys to to kind of research it i, I suspect but but they're my two experiences around sort of exercising and my flares 
both very very difficult uh different should i say it might it might have been a case that you were perhaps more active so if you were to do mm. like things like a fetal car protecting score you, your scores might have been a bit higher than what the this the with the second flare than the first flare mm. um there's kind of different stages of activity and there's different mm. kind of questionnaires that you can kind of assess whether someone's kind of got a a, a mild a, mild, a light to mild activity and moderate and, and then this a, kind of a severe and they also have like the, when you do a steel sample there's a an aspect called fetal car protector and that measures inflammation in the stool and it might be a case of that it was just it was just higher than the second time mm. than it was the first time um but again it, it might not have been as well and 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 sometimes just because it it, it you might just have felt, felt like felt fatigue sometimes not things don't correlate you might have a you might feel like your disease is active but when you do these kind of car protector markers it might actually be lower than the normal average so it's sometimes things just don't correlate the way and it's it's very hard and and this, that's what makes it difficult to research certain outcomes um because everyone's so everyone's so different um with their how how their disease presents itself um but it is, it is quite interesting i wonder after you've had obviously had your surgery do you feel your fatigue levels have differed now after surgery than what they were prior to surgery because the fatigue kind of information in terms of stomas is still the fact that 70 I think it's something 70 percent of individuals with stomas still continue to experience those kind of levels of fatigue um so I'm just interested as well if, if, if it's like fatigue is something that you still kind of experience I mean again. to an extent like when I get to the weekend I could very easily just avoid the world however that has always been the case quite happy to to be antisocial but um the it's better than when I was in, obviously, in outright flair. I'd 100% say that. But um, my biggest sort of problem in terms of what limits me with my exercise, less so the fatigue, I would say, um, because I can override that. It's more than once I sort of get into week three, four, five, my joints keep playing up. So I can't get beyond that at the minute um that would be my current sort of limit but the fatigue it seems to be sort of manageable to be fair that's um nice. not gone but manageable mm -hmm. that's definitely a difference between fatigue and apathy tim <laughs> there, 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 is, there is there is a large amount of apathy in there as well like, <laughs> like trying to create those good habits uh, which is somewhat <laughs> troublesome, um, but have, I imagine this is is quite difficult if you've been in, in long flare, lots of surgery, all that. So you, habit formation for me, it's gone, completely gone. Yeah, um, for sure. I think mine. The difference with with me, I mean, obviously yours was Crohn's, mine was colitis. So I was, you know, very unwell. I, I would never. I was never in remission. So I was all, I was always in a flare type thing for, for 10 years and never, it just was basically just popping steroids like Smarties. And once I had the surgery, it, it we completely changed it. So my, I, I, I didn't notice the fatigue. I mean, obviously post-surgery type fatigue, I happen to have two small children, but I, I would say they're far more tiring than any <laughs> fatigue I have with, with, <laughs> with colitis. Um, I'm far more tired now, but I think that's purely down to having a three month old baby than actually, uh, than, 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 than the stoma wise, but no, the stoma for me has, has completely changed that. So I think it's also the, the mental fatigue, I think takes a lot of it. You know, the, the idea of every day being unwell and planning your day around being unwell and planning your day around what can't i do today it's a very negative headspace to take it takes up a lot of brain power whereas suddenly to for me you know i've been very fortunate to remove that now and i can wake up and you know like 99 percent of other people not worry about having to go to the toilet in the morning or where i have to go this is get up and get on with your day so that mental space for me has cleared it up and i know there are some people with stomas that haven't had quite as a good experience and they've you know still struggle with aspects of it i'm very lucky that i haven't so you know that that headspace i think for me is the biggest you know change in the fatigue aspect the mental the brain fatigue if you will <laughs> you know a bit like when you're in pain people describe it as just really draining pain it's always on their mind and just having that just gone is a big is a big change for the positive i'd have to agree it's, it's made a big difference to me is it, having that um mental and emotional capacity given back um physically i still feel fatigue from time to time but 
a lot more capacity to to deal with uh, quote life um but yeah i think that's a good observation and i'd i'd, I'd probably agree with that rob yeah you s- uh, Tim brings up, well, you both bring up good points, actually, but I was going to ask you, Catherine, about um, you said right at the beginning when you were talking about the research and the systematic review. If anybody's listening to the Noah Systematic Review, it's basically a review of studies and you merge them together, isn't it? It's a simple way of yeah. saying it. But um, you said that they all use different types of exercises yeah. um, and still showed some benefit. But are you able to... Um, use any of that information to give any guidance to people on sort of starting or is that a bit too difficult at the moment it's yeah it's too it's I think because there's so much heterogeneity like so much like variation between what they all did it's it it's you can't kind of take any sort of kind of guidelines from mm. from that um I think it's promising it, it does show that they're kind of going in the, in the right direction um with 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 these sort of studies um, and we did manage to do a meta-analysis in it as well which I think two years before that we tried to do it and it was it was not feasible to do it because there wasn't as, there wasn't as enough studies to put into the into the kind of the analysis uh, side of things um, so there is new emerging studies all the time um, so I'm, I am hopeful that there will be some some kind of clinical guidelines coming out eventually when that'll be i don't know i do plan on doing more research um as much as possible um but i know there's a lot of studies that have been published on uh, clinical trial registers that are kind of coming out so that it is mm. it is a kind of an up-and-coming area um but i, they, I think because the studies have done done something it's not a case of like one they've all done kind of a resistance training and, and different durations i think some of them because they did like walking programs running programs yoga um resistance aerobic it's it's, it's so difficult and to make those kind of comparisons mm. um so I, that's that's the the only downside of the if i think it was a, a huge limitation of the review in itself the fact that mm. it, they they were kind of all the studies were kind of aggregated together but there was was such a uh, variation in them um but yeah, I think it's just a case of watch watch this space, and hopefully we can update the review in a maybe a few years. Obviously, these trials take years to publish, which is the only downside of doing any sort of research. Mm. Uh, clinical trials, t- understandably, you want to have, you want to make sure that trials undertaken in in in, in the best way um, and not rushed. Russian Russian data is not a not a good thing, so they do take years to be published. Um, so hopefully, in in due course, we will have some sort of. Um, some sort of guidelines. Um, there is kind of a, a, a consensus um, around kind of what IBD, P, I, ID, IBD patients should be doing. And there is what the experts do say is that they should do some sort of light to moderate exercise if you've got an inactive to mildly active disease. Um, and that should include like like 30 minutes of exercise um, about three or five days a week, but also doing like resistance trainings, perhaps two or three day, three days a week. Um, but like I said, I mentioned before, it's not, it hasn't been explored. Higher intensities are still very novel. Um, so whether high intensity exercise is is a safe um is, is safe to do is still kind of being explored and, and nothing's been done yet in in mm. patients who have got a severely active disease. Um, and I think that's primarily because the thought is that it's going to obviously make the condition worse. And like you said, like if you if you do have a, an active disease, the last thing you want to be doing potentially is probably doing any sort of exercise. Um, but what is interesting is that some exercise interventions have actually shown that um, the, the a pr- kind of a protective effect. So disease activity markers have actually decreased, which is which is really promising. Um, so it, it, the, the the new research is is, is emerging, but unfortunately, mm. it will take a few few more years to kind of yeah. have any kind of set guidelines come out yet. Yeah, we see similar in the other inflammatory diseases, the ones that I work with, and uh, the things like rheumatoid arthritis. You would yeah. think lifting heavy weights would be bad for, and it's actually the opposite. It's actually yeah. good for it. Um, so I think you know, um, I, I just wanted to say to people who are listening that. Um, the the lack of a specific guideline doesn't mean you don't don't have or you can't do it um it's just it's, it's just not evidence based it, yeah. ha- it hasn't got that evidence base behind it yet but it doesn't mean that it should put you off doing it um Absolutely. it it has beneficial effects for the general population that doesn't mean that, that they won't have this, this the same effects so it's still really important that you are kind of being active um to, and avoiding kind of sedentary behavior um because obviously it does incre- increase your risk of um, other kind of chronic conditions um so you'd rather be active than than inactive 
And um, one one sort of additional thing, I, I seem to remember uh, at, at your talk uh, that I came to listen to, Catherine, that because um, it, it flagged up to my mind because A, it made sense and B, I was aghast because it's actually something that I enjoy doing. Um, there was, I seem, I seem to remember you talking about HIT and potentially increasing inflammatory markers. Yes. Yeah. So they, this was, a, um, I'm trying to remember what, where, what I think I, I might give a study, uh, for example, for that. I think it was around. It was just one study. Yeah. I yeah. There was, um, there's been no term, kind of like long term complications associated with mm. exercise and IBD, but the safety of doing kind of high intensity exercise, it's thought to, de- I, yes, I remember this. It was a, it was a mice study, I think um, I yes. mentioned. Yes. So they basically, for, for, for those of the, you who listen, they, they basically gave mice IBD um, and they made them do high intensity exercise. And what actually, what they actually found was that the, after, after when they did all their inflammatory markers, the inf- um, inflammatory markers actually increased, um, which is obviously not not a good thing. Um, and the thought being kind of around this is that the fact that high intensity exercise can actually decrease blood flow to the the gastrointestinal system, which in turn increases gut motility, which is like the stretching and contraction of muscles um, in the gastrointestinal tract, which actually controls movement, um, movement of food. So it actually quickens up the process, which is obviously something that individuals with IBD probably don't want to do. Um, So it's actually quite interesting because the same mice study, when they did it at a lower intensity, um, actually found that disease activity markers decreased. Um, so it showed an actual protective effect rather than what it showed with the high intensity exercise. But there has been a few um, kind of short bouts of short bouts of studies in 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 humans, um, but none of them had an active disease. Um, so there was one study where um, Crohn's disease patients they exercised on a bike. I think it was about sixty percent of their maximum oxygen consumption, and they saw no worsening of of symptoms, um, or sort of difference in inflammatory markers. Um, and I think there was another study as well that was published quite recently that made people do triathlons. Um, and I think about eighty percent of their scores were normal af- after that, and about twenty percent returned a week later. Um, so there there is research being done on it, but yeah, it, that's that kind of the rationale as to why they think high intensity exercise. Um, may not be good for for individuals with IBD but it's interesting because nothing's kind of emerged yet in terms of how all, all those patients were all inactive obviously the mice had an active disease so it's quite interesting to see whether it, that would that would make things worse um so yeah it really really interesting definitely um, but I think that's why they say like things like marathon runners often they experience things like rectal bleeding um as well because obviously that's quite a high intensity if, if, if they do it for long long periods as well um so yeah interesting um the runner's trots is a fairly uh, documented um phenomenon anyway yeah. as a many people take a modium as a as a way to slow down your gastric motility won't they before yeah. uh before running ultra marathon running i mean i think i had that a bit before anyway before i had apd maybe that was just the start of it i don't know but i always felt that if i went for a run it, it irritated my stomach a bit it was that's actually quite interesting. We we did a um a survey a few, a few years ago, which it was primarily to explore the barriers that people um that people experienced um with doing physical activity and exercise. Um and I think one of the things that was quite evident there was that a lot of patients said that they avoided doing running and jogging because of their IBD. So it was actually the most commonly avoided exercise that was that was done because of IBD. So I thought that that's quite interesting that you said that. And that might be the reason why is that that kind of thought process mm-hmm. is actually going to make my my symptoms worse. So. And also, you're you're generally going to be somewhere away from a bathroom if you're running outside. So the you know going to the gym, you, most gyms are going to have a bathroom in it, I guess. You know, so from my personal standpoint, if I was feeling unwell, I'm either going to go run somewhere where there's some woods. And I'm not running through a town centre, uh, or you know, running somewhere where and you know, they can stop, or you can go run on a treadmill. So if there was times when I had to run and I was feeling quite unwell, I'd go to the gym and run on a treadmill just in case. So I'd have that kind of mental battle with it as well. Yeah, and those are some like, really con- good considerations to kind of think about as well when you, if you, if you do, if you are a bit kind of 
it's completely understandable, especially if you're maybe newly diagnosed or um, or even if, you, if you're not used to doing exercise, it can it can be quite a you can lose your confidence quite a bit with with exercising again. Um, and it is just kind of just trying to make some sort of adaptations, like going running. And if you if you go for a run, just kind of try and make like your route a free plan route where you kind of pass like, friends or family members' houses that you can stop and if you need to go to the toilet. Um, exercising at home until you feel a bit comfortable and kind of get an idea of what your symptoms are going to be like after exercising. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it is just making kind of practical considerations as well. Um, but it is completely understandable if, if especially when you don't know how how you're going to react. And I think, the, I think everyone's kind of got that toilet radar. So as soon as you go somewhere, you, you've automatically, yeah. you're trying to work out where the toilet is. And when you go for a run, that, that unfortunately, I think the, the stress of not knowing where the toilets are can, make things a bit worse um yeah. so it is just trying to t- think of some kind of practical considerations um when you when you do start to exercise again yeah i think it's helpful to uh, understand the the light uh, medium intensity is going to be beneficial as well so it's like you don't necessarily need to go sweating out for a long run to get some of the benefits you can start a little bit more gently and do other things like you say in the house or whatever to to get yourself started i think yeah, sounds like a good it's, idea. it's just really important to kind of go at a pace that you feel comfortable mm. with and there's no rush to get back into it and it's just a case of just trying to take take things easy especially if you've just had surgery surgery and stuff as well but it is just kind of taking things easy not pushing yourself too much and and just going at your own pace um i think that's really important that's a, a useful time for us to, for, for my next question. In, in, is there much, much research evidence base in and around differences with people with stomas and, and ad surgery and stuff like that? Is, is there much out there? Or, or is it mostly currently just IBD without surgery? I think that the, 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 one of the main, there's, there's, there is new research emerging. Um, so there was um, a study. Uh, published last year actually um and that actually looked at um exercising with a hernia uh, a a bulge um and they found that to be it was a feasibility study and they found that to be feasible acceptable by patients so there is new research and stuff coming out there um i think the kind of guy it's I think it's the kind of guidance at the moment um especially if you've if you've just recently had surgery um is to kind of get agreement to from your surgeon, doctor or stoma nurse before you kind of start any sort of exercise. Um, and a lot of the kind of published papers say that it's best to avoid any sort of heavy lifting, um, at least for the first 12 weeks after exercise. Um, but I think your recovery period, there's a lot of variation on recovery periods because it depends on like the age, like type of surgery that you've had, the time that you spent in hospital. Um, and also sort of the level of fitness as well that you had before surgery. Um, but I think even if you were fit before surgery, it's important to start exercising um, slowly and build things up gradually. Um, and it's important to kind of give your body your time, chance to re- recover uh, first as well before you kind of and kind of just kind of take like a steady approach to it. Um, so that's kind of what the what the information said in terms of if you've just had had surgery. Um, in terms of people who have had their their stoma or had surgery for quite a while um the the general consensus is that um i think it's important just to kind of point out as well as that having a stoma shouldn't stop you from exercising and it's completely understandable to have kind of normal uh, it's completely understandable to have concerns um and for your confidence to be knocked um and I would just suggest if you if you are starting is to set yourself some kind of small goals rather than kind of jumping into things that you might have previously done. Um, things like walking and swimming um, are really good exercises to sort of start off with because they put very little strain on your stoma, but make sure that you've got a kind of a ten- intensity that does work for you. Um, I think as well, like stomas kind of pose their own complications as obviously I mentioned, mentioned the complications that are associated with IBD, things like bone density. Um, and I think stomas pose their own complications, um, skin irritation, high outputs, um, hernias. Um, but I think the physical and mental benefits of exercise are kind of well documented. Um, and it's 
important for someone with a stoma to kind of maintain healthy weight, to kind of try and keep your core muscles strong, to try and prevent hernias from developing. Um, and I think there's all, always that kind of like feel good aspect of exercising um, as well, like a handsome quality of life, as, as you both aware is is such an important aspect and I think mental health is 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 something that we don't discuss enough especially in terms of IBD and stomas and I think it's really important that you can increase your mental health and increase you know, decrease, decrease the depression and anxiety um levels by doing some sort of exercise as well um yeah I hope that answers your question I'm off on a tangent yeah. there yeah no, it's very good and it kind of links into kind of where I'm at with well, like my limitation is in and around skin irritation, skin irritation and paranoia is the best word that I can think around hernia because I yeah. keep speaking to, to Miss Patel and I keep going, but so what? She must be fed up with like me going, <laughs> but, but what's the, cause I want, I want data. And she keeps going, yeah. there isn't any, there isn't any. And I'm going, but then what, so what happens if I have it? And, or sorry, if I do get a hernia now, for those who don't have stomas, it gets meshed, but obviously for us, we can't get it meshed. Yeah. But then like, if it's all those things where I'm going, oh, I don't want to do too much. So I'm desperate to exercise, really desperate to exercise. And it's managing that frustration, like you and Jack were saying, is like trying to do a little bit, but my brain wants to do Straight into what I, it what I used to do and also kind of like what Rob did, which is go and run an Ironman around the Arctic, which, um, very impressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and insane. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I think, I think with, with hernias that they, they are, they are common. I think mm. so the, the, the latest figures that I saw, I think, I think something like 50%, um, 50% of people will, will develop a hernia. Um, but I think if, I think what the kind of main, advice is is that as long as your core strength and i'm not suggesting that you go out and do sit-ups or crunches or anything along those lines because that they can be quite uncomfortable and if you do them too early too early that also increase, increases your risk of developing a hernia yeah. so i think it's quite difficult because at the moment because there's no specific guidelines in terms of you your, your core strength needs to be this by this point or it's safe to do this because your core strength would have developed but I think it's just primarily building your core strength so doing things like um yoga tai chi even doing things like like side like, like standing side bends like knee rolls um are really good for like maintaining your your kind of your your mid mid section um mm. and I think it's just important just to there is there they're, they're quite there is quite a lot of athletes as well. So there's NFL players, bodybuilders, wrestlers, um, and they have all returned to their sport after 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 having an ileostomy. Um, and some of them are still participating. Um, but I think it's just trying to be kind of caught. And I, I can appreciate the kind of the nerves around things as well and the cautiousness. And that, I think that's only that's, that's only normal. Um, and I think it is just a case of trying to gradually gradually do things instead of <clears throat> jumping straight into it um because your body still needs time to recover like you you have it's a major operation um and your body needs time to recover and that recovery period is just as important as doing doing things as well um yeah. but yeah i think it, it, it is i can understand your, your frustration definitely um but you, you i mean the, in terms of like the kind of the the information that's that's out there um if you did have a hernia um I think a lot of people wonder as well whether it's actually safe to exercise and that's also a, a concern that is 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 having a can I still exercise if I have a hernia um and I think there is there is a level of caution that needs to be taken there and I think it is a case of speaking with with your doctor before kind of undertaking any sort of new exercise um but the current information suggests that it is important that if you do have a hernia to avoid kind of additional stress and strain on the abdomen so it's avoiding things like the sit-ups and the crunches um overstretching high impact exercises um and it's best to stick to sort of low impact exercises like swimming gentle yoga walking um and you can also get things like protective underwear and like kind of help support your abdomen as well um so you can do some degree of exercise um when you have a hernia but it is important to kind of discuss that with your mm. um doctor as well because obviously everyone's so different with where the hernia is and how big it is and what have you um 
So I can, but I can appreciate your your frustrations, Tim. Mm. I come, especially when I think it's I think a lot of people as well like after they've had surgery and they've done a lot of sport be- previously they expect to kind of jump back into their yeah. sport instantly and be at the kind of physical fitness mm. that they were before surgery but it takes yeah. a while for your yeah. muscles to build my up biggest frustration yeah and it's it's yeah. so it is really frustrating and I know a few people have actually got better at that that their sport because it's I think it's made them more determined in in a way I think that's a, a symptom of IBD and stomas that that's not in these textbooks is that I think there's a level of stubbornness um that you want to you have that kind of determination to 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 achieve to to to, to make yourself better um but it is a frustrating process um mm. and I, and I, I com- completely relate to to what you're saying Tim um but just keep at it. <laughs> yeah, I, I will. I will. I, I think it's uh, it's kind of reassuring and, and equally kind of why I wanted to say it as well. Like you, you just think that you, you know, you're always unique in in what you're thinking, and 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 kind of what I, you know, when Jack and uh, Rob, when we were all talking, we wanted to go. Well, that's perfectly normal to feel those ways. Um, and and it's kind of you know e- even though I know all of those things like you said, it's still reassuring hearing that it's it's perfectly normal. Um, I, so yeah, I think having those are kind of like the athletes, and obviously I know they their physical fitness before before surgery probably was was probably very good. Um, but I think having those athletes that that play in the NFL that were bodybuilders or are still wrestlers, the fact that they can get back to kind of a professional level, um, I think it's quite inspiring. Um, mm. There's a lot more athletes as well, I know, uh, at, at the Olympics and uh, swimming um, and what have you. So I think it's quite inspiring to, to see what they've managed. Obviously, everyone's different in whether it's a different type of IBD, whether it's colitis, uh, indeterminate colitis, um, Crohn's and obviously everyone's so different with their kind of medical history um, and what have you but it's, it is really inspiring to kind of see them go through something very similar um, and kind of come out the other end and say like look I'm back to doing this it might have taken me x amount of months x amount of years but like look where I am now yeah definitely it's, fun- it's funny you mentioned that when when one my thoughts around exercising and hernia risk as well was actually very little during exercise and that was uh I, you know for me exercise was like a controlled environment so i could put on a support belt and i was confident in what i was doing it was safe it was controlled i controlled what i was doing whereas my biggest worry around a hernia is doing the day day to day stuff you know picking myself up at the bath earlier or lifting in the shopping bags and obviously you want to take them all in one go and it's that like twisting lifting bending stuff i'll take the bin out those are times when i felt it and i'm like oh and that doesn't feel that good um so those are my more my worries in like the day-to-day stuff or having a cold and having a cough and a sneeze and yeah those are things which i notice it i worry about far more yeah and and i think the the kind of the development of hernias and um, uh, the, I think it's been linked to, to it can be linked to things like aging I know it's been linked to things like sneezing and coughing as well um, but aging so like muscles naturally naturally becoming uh, weaker uh, being overweight um, having poor abdominal muscles like they're the kind of links at the moment that that are to hernias um, so I think it's it's important to kind of have an appropriate diet uh, so managing your weight having good posture is really helpful Um improving kind of your core strength like you said using the the kind of support belts and garments um and and they have been shown to reduce the risk of developing a hernia so i think it's just constantly doing those sort of things um mm. w- will will help um but it, it it's it's only natural to have those sort of concerns um and at the minute there's no kind of not that i've if anyone has seen anything i'd be very interested to see it but no sort of like longitudinal data so data sets that have gone on for 10 20 years that says this is when most people develop a hernia um and it'd be interesting to kind of see see that um and see Mm. whether there's any sort of correlations with what people are actually doing and when they're doing it so is it like 10 years after surgery is it 12 months is it two days so and obviously we know the risks are increased right after surgery, which is why they suggest not not doing any sort of heavy lifting. Um, mm. But it, and, and what are people's kind of what what's their core strength like at the at the time of a hernia? Is is that is, obviously is that playing a, a major role in it? And and what can we do and when can we do it? 
Um, so those are kind of the questions that are still, there's no kind of certainty around them. Um, so it'd be interesting to kind of see more more data come out in, in that. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. And I, th I think there's th those often those are the worries that people have. And because there seems to be a, a, a mismatch in answers, be, be, you know, as a as someone with a stoma asking surgeons, stoma nurses, uh, you know, the exercise people, whoever it might be, there is very different range of answers from you should never lift anything right up to no, it's absolutely fine. You know, I, I had two different support belt people come and measure me up for a support belt. And one person was like, oh, no, this is absolutely fine. This is how tight it should be. And I was like, really? I can get my whole fist in there. Like, it really doesn't feel very, like, it just feel, it's doing nothing, basically. <laughs> and, it's, you know, I don't know what, what what she thought it was doing. And then the second one was like, oh, no, you're, you're weightlifting and running and doing, she said, you can have one far, far tighter than that. And I was like, okay, cool. That's what I, that's why I felt stronger. You know, I felt it should be like a weightlifting belt, you know, tight around there. So you're going yeah. to doing a heavy squat, you're bracing against it. Definitely. And that's what I felt it was like, um, not a, like a tubey grip around my stomach that, you know, <laughs> you, you breathed out and it just expanded. I was like, <laughs> how's this holding anything in? <laughs> I had a similar experience, Rob, two, two different, two different providers, very, very, very similar. Um, but yeah, I do, yeah. ha I, but I do have a day belt. I do have my day day spanks, which which yeah. keeps things keep things in, and I have my working out one, which does. Like, as you say. I think as well. I think it it just gives you the confidence to be able to go. Mm. I think they're a really good yeah. good tool to use as a kind of a confidence builder. Because I feel like you you feel like you have that additional level of support. Um, yeah. but it is it is really interesting, Rob, that like you're saying that the that you you, you do get different kind of levels of advice and at the moment you can you can go online and you can read certain things and some people will say one thing and some people will say another and it's yeah. what what is the right thing to do what is the right thing to follow so I think that's one of the things that I think and I think it's quite frustrating because I think a lot of stoma patients are kind of subgrouped in in trials with IBD patients because obviously that might, that's probably the reason as to why they've had their stoma in the first place um but then no sort of analysis has been done separately on that on that group um so they kind of get kept pushed in together with 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 um IBD patients or for for bowel cancer uh, mm -hmm. studies so that kind of the individual data for that kind of subgroup isn't necessarily being looked at in in more detail um so it, it is interesting but I think that, that is something that needs to be kind of addressed mm. um down the line as well um definitely yeah definitely yeah hopefully everyone comes and uses this podcast as their resource that'll be <laughs> <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll change the world <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we'll just sign pro some more to you Catherine. that's our <laughs> that's our new tactic oh that'd be amazing <laughs> yeah, definitely. Say, I there needs to be like a lot we a lot more i was quite surprised actually because obviously I've, I've done like obviously systematic reviews so the the overall of, it's a more kind of thorough review and then you have like a narrative review where you kind of get the the knowledge and expertise from other people around you and you use online resources and what have you like not as as, as kind of robust essentially um and there's just not much out there at, at all um which you would think given the fact that a lot of people have a stoma mm. um, and have them for different reasons it's it's a case of that they there is a lot of information in terms of products um and i think that's that's great i think the products have changed as well like dr drastically in the last decade um which which is really good but i think just things like this is so there's areas where I, there's a lot of a lot of gaps and it would be nice to start kind of fill those fill those gaps um and it's only kind of doable with like kind of talking to people who have been through that process and you can kind of identify where the gaps are and then that can lead on to kind of larger larger trials um mm. so hopefully they i mean they are they are starting to be up and coming so hopefully they, we can see some some more data uh soon but that that recent study on the um on the whether i think it was a pilates study whether that had any effect on um a a, a bulge um was, was a really interesting study. I think it's kind of the first kind of step and stone in that direction. So really good study to read if you if you get a chance. And I think you can also, um, as uh, stoma, I wouldn't say sufferers, stoma people, stoma st osteomates, whatever we want to call ourselves, the or feed the information back to the stoma product company, because unless they have people who are feeding back with problems, issues, matters arising, they don't really 
they don't know. You know, I had experience where the actual, if you think of that, if you think of an uh, oval shaped stoma bag, the actual edge of the bag is quite sharp. And if you, if I was running for a long period, the actual egg, edge of the bag was really quite damaging or really cutting my skin. And if I was going out for a whole day, by the end, I'd look under my stoma belt and it was like bleeding all down my skin. It's macerated the outside of like my flank. And I, it took me ages to work out where this was coming from. And I had to come feed it back to the codoplast. And I was like, I've worked out. It's the edge of the bag that's actually cutting me. And they were like, oh, but we've never had anyone who's using these bags and running for 10 hours. So we've never like, it's never been a problem uh, before. So they were like, oh, so what we've done is they 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 made some like additional things to stick on the outside of the skin to like protect it against that. And they said, oh, we can make bags with bigger extenders so that then mm. it protects the skin. So they they had solutions to problems which I faced, which you know initially they didn't have solutions, but only after speaking to them do they come up with some stuff to to feed back. So when we're having these issues, feed it back to those companies as well, and they're the ones who then can come up in their in their R and D, you know, laboratories and <laughs> come up with cool stuff. I have to say, like, ten, I think ten years ago, like, uh, extremer bags weren't they weren't waterproof. That like you, yeah. you 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 had to get special special bags for for if you wanted to go swimming. There, there was a different. So they weren't bag. waterproof. They're a lot. Oh, well, no, they, yeah, you, yeah, you, Rob. You couldn't you awful. couldn't go into you couldn't go into. Um, like so you wouldn't feel comfortable going into a, a swimming pool no. um, or anything. Like the, the, the adhesive around the bag would 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 essentially come off. They weren't very very adhesive, um, but now that the, the stickiness and stuff of them is fantastic. Um, and I know a lot of people are a bit concerned around using a, a going swimming with with a stoma. Um, but a lot of the products now are so discreet. Um, they're extremely secure and there's so many different brands now with different like swimwear. Um, and I think a lot of people are actually kind of concerned around like what other people think. And I always say to people, you could go into it if you go into a swimming pool and you you're in there for two like say two hours and you come out again and you ask all those people around you, what colour costume that you were wearing. And I don't think half of them would be able to tell you what, what colour colour costume you were wearing. So no one's even noticing. Um, and it, I think it's just, it's, it's, I think it's just kind of building, building confidence up again. Mm. Um, but I, yeah, the, the, the products and everything have come, come so far, but you're, you're right though, Rob, anything that the, you, you kind of notice that doesn't, that isn't, isn't essentially, it might not be, it might be right for everyone else, but it might not be right for you, but it's really important for you to address that. Um, just because it might not be right for everyone some people might not be kind of kind of saying that um, and then they can make any sort of changes and, and adaptations um, for, for you and it'll make kind mm. of day-to-day -day living easier for you as well so uh, definitely yeah I think that's a great thing brilliant yeah um, I was just going to say just one 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 hopefully final final bit but i was just wondering catherine whether you could just kind of summarize what we've spoken about very quickly in sort of i mean i have in my mind like um what what would be your summary for either patients li listening in um or clinicians you know generalists um who who might be sort of working with advising people with with these sorts of conditions what would be a general sort of summary for um what we've spoken about i think from from a a, a kind of an, a summary i think it's being being physically active is 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 extremely important and we've discussed the the kind of the specific the specific complications that are associated with um with IBD and with with stomas, um, and the actual effect exercise can can have on those complications. Um, so, in terms of for individuals with IBD, it's it's exercise is is, is safe to do, um, especially if you have a light to moderately active disease. Um, I would just be more cautious if you do have a severely active disease or if you're doing any sort of high intensity exercise. Um, with those with stomas, um, it is completely normal and understandable to have the concerns around a hernia. Um, and I would just suggest speaking to a physiotherapist, speaking to a fitness trainer at, 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 at your local gym, um, have a discussion with them before you kind of start anything new, especially if it's something that you haven't done previously. Doing the incorrect 
technique of things can cause just as much damage um, if you don't perform it correctly. So I think it's just making sure that you, if you are going to undertake anything sort of new, that you do get the right information um, information to do it. Um, and yeah, just nothing's off the table. Um, and don't let have an IBD or, or a stoma put you off doing not just exercise, but anything. Um, and I think it's really important to just gradually and carefully build up intensity and just primarily just listen to your body, listen to what your body's telling you. I think that's kind of the the main the main part. Just listen, listen to your body. You know your, mm. bo- your body better than anyone else. Fantastic. I, I'd, I'd agree uh, that, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's sort of my take on the, the twice I've, I've, I've listened to you, you, you talk and, um, no, fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine, for uh, for taking the time to uh, yeah. to talk to us this evening. Yeah, thank no, you. Happy. Fascinating. Brilliant. I think that uh, that brings us to the end of that of that podcast. Unless Tim's got anything he wants to, uh, no, to no, add, no. In, add, add in at the end. So shall we uh, wrap up and say goodbye? Do you want to you, wanna, you wanna plug your Substack, Tim? Oh yeah, you've Tim. Got, go you got away, your yeah. first Do like, that. didn't you, on Substack? I, I did. I got a like from somebody called Millie on Substack. Uh, no, no, what? it's fine. What is that? <laughs> Substack. <laughs> oh, Jack knows all about Substack. So, can, it, Substack is it's like a new version of social media, Catherine. It's like Oh no, um, not another one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very it's it's good. It's like it's like uh, reinventing blogs. That's it would be a simple oh, wow. way of w- w- simple way of doing it. But then you can email your followers and stuff. So it's quite good. I have to say if if either of you get the time to blog about your experience, I think that would be really helpful for a lot of people just to hear your kind of um your 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 good stories obviously i know tim i think with like the skin irritation and stuff i think that's completely mm. n- like normal i think i would i would talk about that as well um mm. but i think it's just making sure that people do hear that there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel yeah. um and it's not all doom and gloom i think, and, I think you know, that's uh yeah that's episode three isn't it um i can't remember who we put who we roped round first it was t- with life think, according to tim or is it life according to rob i can't remember i think but, i think you said me but i don't Probably. think it matters yeah <laughs> but yeah we, we, we were we were planning on doing that very, very very much catherine and then sort of what we were going to do i say we jack with his editing software was probably like transcribe the the podcast as well which substack uh which has um the capabilities where it just transcribes it so if people prefer to read it they can just read it so um yeah it will have audio um basically we're doing a whole thing where either rob or myself are being quizzed and whatnot by the other two about the, the story and the journey and everything in between sounds good uh, this, if you wanted another topic area well, I thought you probably be aware of it, but things like nutrition i think nutrition is a mm. really really big one if you if you know anyone who looks at nutrition and ibd or nutrition and uh stomas i think that would be a really i know a lot of mm. a lot of individuals that we spoke to don't know what they should be eating or when they should be eating it so they avoid a lot of things which causes more problems than mm. than good we'll we'll add that in and we'll get on to that <laughs> where can we find you catherine are you are you are you on the social medias or um i do not have i i do not i do tick uh, not tiktok i do uh, it's a twitter or x but i haven't been on for a, i think a good seven months so remember my password might be a bit of a, <laughs> of a problem but I'm, I'm not on social media um bar bar twitter um and if i can remember my password um i will tweet um is that still the thing or is it what, what's the new one is it oh, i don't even i think you post on i think you post on x now but everybody still says oh, you tweet on twitter tweet. so i would i no one cares anyway we'll 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 um we'll direct them to to your um to warwick or somewhere for you yeah that so would be great that would be great thank you and thank you for having me as well it's been lovely to chat to you and kind of hear your, your stories as well and keep up with the iron man challenge because that is something that um do you know what? I think it's inc- absolutely incredible absolutely incredible to do an Ironman challenge regardless of whether you've got IBD or not I, the people who do that I'm just like hats off to you that and is mental. a <laughs> Thank tough you, thing tough thing thank you just, just to thank get you. out of bath, bath, bathroom duty isn't it yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with, 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 with the kids he's just like I can't I can't do bath time I've got, I've got four hour run to, to do I have to run all day <laughs> yeah. and then I'll be tired <laughs> <laughs> then I'll be truly fatigued yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> brilliant. Thank yeah. you very much. Brilliant. No, no problem. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Talk Thanks, everyone. Cheers, bye. Bye-bye.